Hello and welcome to Twisted Britain, a podcast on true crime in Britain with a sprinkling of the weird and the macabre. And your hosts are me, Bob Dale. And me, Nadine Royal. We're a couple of friends who met in the pub and developed a friendship based on our mutual love of booze, podcasts and pub quizzes. We met in the set in Stirling and that's where we record. Each week we'll both tell a story of something twisted. One long one and one short one. And we'll decide who goes first. Based on the flip of a coin. Yay. Hey. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Uh, I'm good. And uh, do you know how I know it's the 1st of October today? Why? Because you've come dressed as Freddy Krueger. <laughs> I'm so glad you recognise it. Um, so it has to be within 30-ish days of Halloween. It's the first day of Halloween, motherfucker. No, it, Halloween doesn't have an advent. There's 31 days of Halloween they start today. You're, honestly, I'm done it's with It's my favourite time of year. I might be done with you I already bought tonight. This, I bought this jumper, so I'm wearing a Freddy Krueger jumper. It's not all ripped and raggedy, it's very nice and intense. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, wait until I fall down drunk on Halloween. Um... Yeah, I bought this jumper whilst I was just out shopping. I thought, you know what? I deserve some new clothes. It's been a long time. I went shopping, went into this little shop who already have their Halloween regalia out. And I saw it, £12, bargain, as if I'm not going to buy it. And it's like super cosy. It's my winter jumper. No, it's your Halloween jumper. Well, yes, but I'm also going to wear it all year. I'm um, not going to let you. Tough shit. Next uh, week, I'm waiting until you see what I wear next week. The same jumper. No, <laughs> I've got another one. <laughs> Uh, so for those of you listening, if you, in case you haven't guessed or haven't listened to our episodes in the past, Nadine's a bit of a fan of Halloween. Just a small bit fan so we, of the spooky. So although it is the start of October, we will have a special Halloween episode coming out. It'll probably just come out on, on Halloween is what I thought we decided. Yeah, on the normal time. So it would be in place of our normal episode that week. Is it? Is it? Halloween's a Thursday. Okay, are we doing two then? Two that week? I thought that's, we should probably discuss this off air, but I thought that's what we discussed. Okay, cool. Should I consult the, actually let me consult the calendar Check the schedule we, I've got it down that we're doing Halloween release on the 31st And another normal episode on the on the 1st Well lucky you lot, you get uh, two episodes in two days Lucky me, I get to edit two episodes for that week as well <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the one that comes out on the 1st we will be recording that week So Yeah, that's fine, don't worry about it Happy Halloween <laughs> Yay yeah, no. Um, yeah. So yeah, how's your research gone this week? Yeah, fine, thank you. How's yours? All right, are we going to be honest and say the two of us were slightly confused as to what we were doing? Well, there's been a big, um, we had a bit of a, like a blunder, didn't we, last month, was it? Where It was entirely my fault, yeah. Yeah, but whatever, we're not pointing fingers. You are. <laughs> you are currently <laughs> pointing fingers at me. Um, but yeah, so we were confused as to who is on long and who is on short, but we both seem to think I was on long, so... Either way, we basically hit reset. And start it again. So yeah. we'll go from here. Also, by the way, can we just bring up the fact that we've not recorded in two weeks and we actually just killed our intro? We nailed uh, I that. Was, I was trying to ignore it in case we jinxed it. Well, we've so done it now. We can't jinx it now. <laughs> no, I mean for the rest of the podcast. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. Well. What um, have you been doing? You've not been very well. Are you, are uh, you well I now? Have, I'm, I'm better. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. You just sound a slight bit husky. It's a bit sexy. Uh, yeah, my, my sec- yeah, sex phone voice. That's what it is. Um, <laughs> Yeah, my sex phone, not my phone sex. It's, <laughs> it's, a sex slightly phone. Different. it's my business. Yeah, you know. So you've got like a work phone, a home phone, sex phone. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then my burner, of no, course. Of course. Who's not got a burner? <laughs> Is um, that for organising all those illegal uh, ASBO barbecues that you are such a fan of throwing? Would you stop telling everybody about them? Sorry, sorry. They're just going to get out of control now. <laughs> uh, no, I'm good. Since, in fact, since we've recorded last, I've been away from with work. Yeah, you went to Amsterdam. How was it? Uh, I really don't know. I spent most of it in my bed. That's sad. Yeah, so I went to the, the, the work crap during the day, uh, and then back to the hotel pretty much. That's a bit boring, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. day I left, I went for a nice walk through Vondel Park and stuff like that, That's so nice. it was sunny, so that was, stuck the cans on, listened to podcast, uh, and went for a walk. It was good, actually. Lovely. Uh, Fred and Rose Tapes, if you've not listened yet. No, I've not. So I listened to the Fred and Rose Tapes. Fred and uh, Rose Tapes. Couple of, first couple of episodes while walking around Amsterdam. It was good fun, actually. Um, <laughs> I like how... Um, this is definitely the platform to say that that was good fun because a lot of people would be like, that does not sound yeah. like fun. Weirdos. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take that though. You're wearing a Freddy Krueger jumper. Excuse me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go and weird shame somebody else, thank you. Um, so yeah, I've had plenty of time to get a story together tonight <laughs> and you'll be happy to know, finished time about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> just just the normal then. Do you want um, a confession? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I finished mine at about 7 o'clock tonight. Yeah, just not finished. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, as long as we know what we're saying, it's okay. Yeah. I feel like I had something else to say, but I don't... But I don't... <laughs> that's, that's okay, that. well we'll just crack on Shall then. we just... Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Uh, so you count. Uh, shout, count, you <laughs> shout. 
Heads or tails? Uh, let's go tails. Tails, um, you go first. It's heads. Hey, me first. You're up and you're on long. I am indeedy. So we've decided. Uh, I should have got another beer before you started. Do you want to? Uh, yeah. Should All right. We, should we pause it? Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. And that's us back. <laughs> that's, us, that, that's us back for uh, Bob's pint break. <laughs> hey. Oh. That's really bad. It makes it sound like I need an extra drink because you're about to talk at me for a while. I just took that as as it was. It is. Yeah. So that's fine. Go. <laughs> yeah. Carry well, on. Yeah, no, we're fine. So, my story this week, you might have heard of it. It's quite a famous one. Um, it's the story of a little girl called Jeanette Tate. Mm-hmm. You know it? Uh, know of it. Don't know the details you're about to tell me. Okay, so let's go. So Jeanette Tate was born on the 5th of May, 1965, and was just 13 years old when she disappeared whilst delivering newspapers in Aylesbury, Devon, England, on the 19th of August in 1978. The total population, by the way, of Aylesbury at the time was less than 500 people. It's a very small place. Excellent details. Thank you. Um, Jeanette was an only child. Her parents, John and Sheila, had her in Somerset, and then they relocated to Cornwall and then Devon, which is where they were living when she disappeared. Jeanette's parents separated when she was young, and her father remarried. She lived with her father and her stepmother, Violet, and her stepsister, Tanya, at Barton Farm Cottage in the East Devon village of Aylesbury. Though she lived with her father, she did actually keep contact with her mother. Ginny, as her family called her, enjoyed school and her ability at maths had amazed the family from a young age. Do we know why she lived with the dad, not the mum? No. No? Just because I think in that kind of time frame... Yeah, it's quite unusual, isn't it? But no, I don't know. Um, she She also loved animals, writing and composing poetry and was curious about the world, which apparently was a facet of her personality which helped her to overcome a natural shyness that she had. Okay. So by all accounts, a lovely little girl. Yeah, I was about to say that. She sounds like a lovely girl. Um, there was nothing exceptional about August the 19th uh, in 78. John, her dad, left the house at 7.30am to take his wife, Violet, to work at the hospital in Exeter. He was back home for 10am to make the two girls breakfast. Tanya was preparing to go on a fortnight's holiday to Cornwall with her birth father. Um, and the girls went off to the post office for some sweets. At 20 past 12, midday, uh, John drove Tanya and her boyfriend to Exeter to catch her coach, leaving Jeanette alone at home. And that was the last time that he'd ever see her. Uh, it's always a horrible sentence, isn't it? I know. Yeah. Um, but all accounts, a normal day. Other than never seeing her again. Yeah. Um, Jeanette set off from Barton Farm Cottage sometime after 2pm to deliver copies of the Express and Echo newspaper. Riding her blue Kalkoff bike, she rode through Ellsbear along Withen Lane and out of the village to the busy A3052, um, which is the main road that connects Exeter to the seaside town of Sidmouth. It was busy with holiday traffic as she crossed the road, and outside the White Horse Inn, she collected a bundle of papers from the delivery van and began her round. Jeanette disappeared while delivering newspapers shortly after 3.30pm on Saturday, 19th of August, 1978. Moments before she disappeared, two of her school friends saw Jeanette walking along Within Lane, pushing her bike. Jeanette had delivered 14 newspapers by this point and talked briefly with her friends as they walked up the lane. At the top of the hill, Jeanette got back on her bicycle and rode ahead as her friends paused to read an article in the newspaper that she'd given them. Jeanette would not normally have been doing this paper round, um, but had agreed to do it for one week as the boy who normally did it was away on holiday and sadly this was actually the final day of her doing this newspaper round so she wouldn't have normally been in this area no she, she had a paper round anyway yeah she had one anyway but this wasn't her round that was extras ex- holiday extras yeah um several minutes after seeing her the two girls discovered Jeanette's bicycle lo- lying in the middle of the road several newspapers she had been scheduled to deliver were scattered across the tarmac Jeanette would have remained in sight of the two girls as she cycled ahead until she'd gone around a bend in the road. So it's reason that whatever had happened to Jeanette happened within around five to ten minutes of her bumping into these two girls. Because like they just like kind of like casually meandered behind her as she cycled on up ahead to deliver her papers. Right, okay. And they like could see her. She went round a bend. They were just strolling along the road, came around the bend, and there's the bicycle and these strewn newspapers on the road that's terrible I've got this uh, image in my head of like the back wheel spinning yeah, like on the still, bike yeah and, like and, still yeah, spinning oh. so around 25 minutes later um, after they discovered the bicycle 
John and Violet Tate returned home um, to find the two girls there with Jeanette's bike. And the girls were asking, you know, is Jeanette at home? Like she's left her bike in the road. Yeah. And when they discovered that she wasn't there, the two girls, John Violet and several of their friends and neighbours began searching around for her, like looking over hedges, like yeah, calling out her name yeah, up and course, down the roads, yeah. you know, like wondering where she's gone. Um, and at around 5 p.m., John then reported his daughter missing to Devon and Cornwall police. So this is how long later? So it was about 3.30 she went missing. Okay, so an hour and a half. Yeah, hour and a half passes of that, you like searching around and then eventually you go like, that's a fair, where um, is she gone? That's a fair time to go, oh, she could have just done a bolt or mm-hmm. be in the park or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but oh. I think like the thing with Jeanette was like, this was very out of character. Like she was a very good little that's girl. Good. Like, yeah, that's what I could actually use. She wasn't like the type to just like bounce and like not, you yeah. know, say anything. Um, within hours of Jeanette's disappearance, police mounted an extensive search. The search for Jeanette Tate would prove to be the most extensive search for a missing person in the history of Devon and Cornwall police. So 70 uniformed policemen and 50 detectives from Devon and Cornwall were assigned to the search and they were assisted by mounted police from Avon and Somerset as well. Um, there were also RAF and rescue helicopter searches overhead and whilst they were going on all of the ponds in the Ellsbury area were searched by underwater search units and search dogs also looked in the surrounding yeah. terrain so it was like a That's massive a big, straight big, big off search. the bat yeah. massive search like ensued because you have to remember as well this is like 78 yeah this isn't like the norm like for a small a small small town like under 500 people yeah, in this yeah, town, totally. for this girl just to vanish and nobody and then like a quarter of the population of the town in police officers turn up. Yeah, to look for her, yeah. and there's nothing. Yeah, that's mad. No sign. So police commandeered the village hall and coordinated their searches and daily briefings from that building, which was a stone's throw away from Barton Farm Cottage, where she was living. But as the first 48 hours slipped by and there was no sign of Jeanette, the initial high hopes were given way to like a growing anxiety that something very bad had indeed happened to her. I think that's a fair completely, presumption. Completely normal. Yeah. Yeah. So put in charge of the missing person investigation was Detective Superintendent... Super, <laughs> super what now? <laughs> I don't know. Superintendent. A superintendent. <laughs> what, does, what does he do, Nadine? Jesus, it's been ages since I've had a proper stumble. As well, a superintendent, um, of course... Is an intardent that wears a cape. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> Um, so put in charge of the missing person investigation was Detective Superintendent. Oh, sorry. Did you mean Superintendent? <laughs> right, okay. Eric Rundle. He was a vastly experienced officer and the second most senior detective in Devon and Cornwall. Be- below him, detectives were divided into teams, each with responsibility for a specific area. The police quickly dismissed the idea that Jeanette had ran away from home as when she went missing, she had no other possessions on her person other than the clothes that she was wearing. She had also left behind money she'd been saving for an upcoming family holiday in her bedroom and further to that, she'd left the customer's money that she'd already collected on her paper round in her purse, which was still on her bike. So this is definitely not a runaway. Yeah, she's not just bounced. Like, and also, like, as if you'd get off your bike to run away, you'd go on the you'd bike. You'd take the bike, wouldn't you? Obviously. Of course you would, yeah. So, like, she's got no money. She's only got her clothes on. So, you know, she's got nothing with her. Um, and, of course, that's back way before having a mobile phone and stuff on your person was a thing. So she's just vanished into thin air, quite literally. Yeah. Um, the possibility of a hit-and-run traffic accident was also ruled out as there were no tyre marks on the road and her bicycle was undamaged. It was thought quite quickly that she had been abducted. Oh. And, and if it had been anything, if it had been like a car accident or anything like that, her friends would have heard. She yeah, wasn't, they would have heard she and they would that have, far away. They would have probably reached the scene as, as it yeah, happened, absolutely. after it happened, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, so it was quite quickly thought that she'd been abducted and a description of Jeanette was circulated. She was described as boyish, five foot tall, with close styled brown hair, She was suntanned and she was wearing a white cotton t-shirt with her name embroidered in red letters on the left shoulder, light brown trousers and white plimsolls. Standard girl dress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Eyewitnesses reported seeing a maroon Triumph or similar vehicle upon Within Road at around the time of the disappearance and police issued a photo fit picture of a man they wanted to question in relation to the incident. This man was described as being a very handsome individual in his early 20s with a pale complexion, short dark hair, who'd been wearing a light-coloured shirt. Uh, Me until you said dark hair. 
Did you take the handsome straight away and just think I was talking about you? Sorry, I d- there was the, re- the rest of the sentence. <laughs> um, so despite... <laughs> I heard early 20s and zoned out. Yeah, no chance. <laughs> handsome in early 20s. It must be me. Yeah, it must be me. Um, despite the police inves- investigation and a search of the surrounding countryside involving thousands of volunteers, Jeanette's disappearance remains unexplained. In 2002, DNA belonging to Jeanette was found on one of her jumpers that her mother kept, which would allow her body to, to be identified if discovered. Sorry, I thought you were going to say something. Um, Detective Superintendent Rundle and his immediate superior, Detective Chief Superintendent Proven Sharp, who I feel like that rang a bell with me, Proven Sharp. I feel like I've done a story involving him before. I should, I need it's to an check. excellent name. I know, it's a great name, Proven Sharp. I um, don't. I don't remember anything. No. That you, no. It just the minute I. You've maybe so, you've maybe read it somewhere. Maybe, but yeah. I, don't. I, I feel like it just rings a bell. Um, he decided. They decided at the beginning of the investigation that what they needed to help find Jeanette um, was maximum media exposure. So on the evening Jeanette vanished, the local and national press were alerted to attend a press call in Aylesbury on Sunday morning, the following day. Reporters from the Exeter Express and the Echo, which coincidentally were the papers that Jeanette was delivering at the time. Well, that's a horrible coincidence, isn't it? Yeah. Um, p- along with the Western Morning News, BBC um, and the Press Association and some other national titles, they assembled at 8am in Within Lane, which is where she went missing from. The bike was positioned at the spot it was found <coughs> and some papers were scattered across the ground. And the photos taken that day of the bike and the papers hit all of the national papers the following Monday morning and it catapulted the investigation into the national consciousness. So like that was like quite a big thing that they like restaged like the scene of like the bike and the papers, you know, like, like she's crime, gone. Crime watch style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they took all these photos and they splashed them across all the papers. And a couple of like the local papers and I think one of the bigger ones ran stories about her every day for a month. Like, you know, trying to get this like attention out there have you seen this girl you burn that story and burn that image into the the public so that if anybody sees her you know absolutely there is no doubt well that's that's, i mean they still do that with everything um all that kind of um like everybody knows what madeline mccann looks like well exactly you'll never forget will you No, i and that's that same kind of thing isn't it if you keep running it keep running it keep running it you're never going to forget that yeah you'll never forget that name and that face yeah like that's the point and i think it's like a they're right like it is a very good kind of tool to be used oh, you, you, you had know. a million sets of eyes to the case then mm-hmm. don't you yeah absolutely so good. especially back then like such a lack of cctv and stuff and probably loads more people reading newspapers oh uh, yeah because you're not on your phone all the time and stuff you yeah. don't have them so yeah, yeah you're reading the and paper you've not got that 24 hour uh seven day a week news coverage rolling on the television mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff so yeah that, that that's your main that's your outlet out- uh, yeah absolutely yeah for sure so but nonetheless nothing still nothing um And then in the early 1980s, so a few years after, detectives travelled to Australia to interview a potential new lead. And for a brief moment, hopes were raised that a suspect had been identified, but it wasn't to be. Police decided the lead was a dead end, and for almost 20 years, the investigation headed nowhere. Cold case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this might be one of my first. I I was just going to say, I don't think you've done a cold case. I don't know if I have. Um, Police were convinced somebody had abducted Jeanette, and the most likely outcome was that she had been transported from the scene and murdered. And it was a reality that nobody wanted to face. But um, in the 1990s, a man was arrested in the Scottish borders after abducting a child. His crimes were so abomin... Oh, I wish I hadn't put that word in. His crimes were so abominable... Abhorrent. Thank you. That he was deemed a monster. Serial killer Robert Black... Uh-huh. ...was convicted in 1994, the year is born... For similar, <laughs> for similar crimes involving the abduction and murder of three young girls in the 80s and was subsequently questioned by Devon and Cornwall police in connection with the Tate case. During the course of his job as a long-distance delivery van driver in the 70s, Black had made deliveries in the extra area, so it was reason that he'd know it pretty well. It was also believed that his timeline would fit perfectly because if he was working in the area and knew it well, he could have abducted Jean- and murdered Jeanette at the end of the 70s and then moved on to his next victims throughout the 80s. Right, okay, yeah. So his victims were, just to put it out there, I might cover it properly one day, but... Yeah, absolutely. Just to, to put it out there. His victims throughout the 80s were Susan Maxwell, who was 11. She was abducted, sexually assaulted, and murdered on July 30th, 1982 
Black disposed of her body 264 miles away from where he had taken her. Another victim was Caroline Hogg, who was five, disappeared on July 8, 1983, and her body was found 310 miles away. And on March 26, 1986, Sarah Harper, who was 10, vanished after going to buy bread at the local shop in Leeds, and Black dumped her body 71 miles away from where she was taken. So the, the kind of MO fits then. Fits perfectly. Yeah. In 1996, an eyewitness claimed to have seen a vehicle of the model he, which Black was known to have driven um, at Exeter Airport. So they said that they saw it at Exeter, Exeter Airport in 78 on the day of Jeanette's disappearance. The police inquiries were unable to establish that Black had been in Aylesbury that day. And um, though there were like several recorded interviews conducted with a pioneering expert in the treatment of child sex offenders, who was named Dr. Ray Weir, which he did this back in the 90s, Black disclosed extensive knowledge of the precise scene and circumstance from which Jeanette was abducted. Isn't it a horrible world we live in that somebody needs to have the expertise in that? Yes. Really is, isn't it? Yes. That's, that, that, that was my first thought there Sad when you reality, said that. reality, isn't yeah. it? Sorry, that was no, just... Yeah. not at all. The Crown Prosecution Service decided in August 2008 that insufficient evidence existed to charge Black with Jeanette's murder. After Black's conviction in 2011 for the murder of nine-year-old Jennifer Cardi, um, they tried to like mount a new case against him because there were such similarities. So Jennifer was abducted and murdered by Black on August 12th, 1981, so three years after Jeanette had gone missing. He struck her and took her while she was cycling to a friend's house in Ireland. So it was like, when this came about, he was, he, so he was like convicted of the three that he did throughout the 80s. He was convicted in the 90s. And then it was later on that they then convicted him for this fourth Okay. Which yeah, he'd yeah, done following. previous to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they managed to finally like stick him for that, you know. Yeah. And it was thought, you know, that was eighty one, so it's totally reasonable to believe that he could have committed another one way before this, like a few years before. So you've backdated it far enough that, that another step in time doesn't make any difference. Yeah, why would it? Yeah, absolutely. Um Devon and Cornwall police reviewed the case in June two thousand fourteen in the hope of finding sufficient real evidence to prosecute Black. At the time of Black's death in January 2016, Devon and Cornwall Police were just five weeks away from submitting a file to the Pro- Crown Prosecution Service in which they sought a new decision on whether to prosecute him for Jeanette's um, disappearance. The file was submitted in April 2016 and the Crown Prosecution Service said that due to Black's death, there would be no posthumous decision to charge him with Jeanette's murder. The full extent of this police case against him has never been revealed, but it is known that a witness claims to have seen Black acting suspiciously, suspiciously on August 19th, 1978 at Exeter Airport. There is also believed to be a petrol receipt which puts Black in the southwest at the time that is not known exactly how close to Aylesbury this receipt places him. But that was like a major part of the case that they built against him. Like, like In later years, they found this receipt that would place him near enough that it wouldn't be without the realms of ridiculousness. You Based know? on the amount of fuel he bought, he could have made it there with from from wherever he bought mm-hmm. it. Yeah, right, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, on the 25th anniversary of the case in 2003, Jeanette's parents, John and Sheila, both stated that their belief is that she is no longer alive. Police have amassed more than 20,000 cards in a filing system related to the case, which are stored at the Devon and Cornwall Police Headquarters in Exeter. And in August 2018, on the eve of the 40th anniversary of his daughter's disappearance, John Tate made a further plea for information about the case, saying, I'm not even 100% sure Black did it. I need proof that Black killed her. He said that his rapidly declining health meant that he could no longer make his annual trip from Manchester to Aylesbury, and that his final wish was to give Jeanette a dignified Christian burial and to be buried alongside her, but sadly, her body is still yet to be found. That's awful, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You've got to wonder then, do they... I wonder if they hold any hope because they haven't found the body yet that she may still be alive. They said, like they said, that they they believe she's not. They've absolutely they've, yeah, they've given like up hope little, entirely. Yeah. Well, it's been 40 years. Well, yeah, no. Uh, but I, I'm just... I'm, yeah, like I say, I'm thinking out loud. She'd be 53 yeah. if she was alive. It's not that old? It's not that old, but you'd like wonder, you know, like... She would have thought, who am I by now? And like, if you were... Kidnapped at thirteen, you'd surely have a pretty good memory of. Yeah, that's true. Actually, it's not. She like wasn't like a, a tiny. You kid. weren't a baby at that yeah. point. No, it's just awful. And um, yeah. that story was actually 
<laughs> funnily enough, um, my colleague at work, Gemma, suggested I cover the story because okay. she was doing the um, cat litter trays and we have hundreds of newspapers oh, right, that okay. are like that we use you know that people have like donated to us to use like in the center for and have you got things. one from 2016 and, and yeah she's right, got okay. she saw it on them the, like one of the papers and read it and was like oh that's good and told me about <laughs> it so that's for you Gemma but, hi Gemma um, how are you um no it was good it's sad though isn't it I think that is my first cold case I don't really like a cold case because no. I hate not knowing yeah and it's I it, think I'm I'm pretty firm on it's probably Robert Black. Oh, you think you definitely think it is? You're, yeah, to like, be honest, because like based the, on what you've just said there, I would go with like a, a grab and go, and then kill them later and dump the body is what what he did. And it's like it fits that like the fact that her friend saw her, she cycled off along the road, went round a wee bend. They were not long bef- behind her, and she's just gone, vanished, vanished completely. And like yeah. the fact that it wasn't her normal route tells me that it's not pre-planned no it's been a, a it's crime been, of opportunity mm-hmm. yeah and that was his specialty that's what he did right yeah. you know like he just saw these young girls saw his opportunity and took it when he could like bundle them into his van and stuff but we'll cover that probably another time but um like that's what that's what he did and like she fits it perfectly like this young girl alone on a bike delivering papers like in the m- middle of this quiet sleepy town no witnesses around you know on a little lane yeah. And the fact that there's like there's like the woman that came forward um and said she saw this like maroon triumph or similar type car. She was like quite she was thought to be like quite a credible witness. Like she was on holiday in the area with her family and she came forward to say that she'd seen this car in the area. And then I think it was like later on when they were like really struggling for information. I think they like they put her under I didn't write it down. I'm sure they put her under like hypnosis to try and get as much of that memory as they could out of her. You know, like tell us more about the car, tell us about the person that you saw like in the car. And she did everything she could. And the car was like pretty much a dead match for the car that Robert Black drove. Um, his car was also in him. He was supposedly seen at Exeter Airport acting bizarrely and stuff on the same day like it's the, and like and then the receipt apparently placing him there there's just like a lot of if it wasn't him there's it's a just, lot of it's circumstantial like a, if it wasn't him that, yeah it's very like coincidental that he a child serial killer who snatches girls from the street willy-nilly yeah, was in the same area playing completely as playing somebody else advocate that would do here, that that his only his first crime that he was committed uh or convicted of sorry yes so at that point, he wasn't a child abductor. So do you know what I mean? Just yes. like, like so that I'm I'm absolutely not defending him at all. No, but no. I'm just thinking out loud here that, that um, if that was his first one, mm-hmm. it just seems so clean that he, it's the one that he got away with. Well, the thing is though, is that so he's been convicted of four before yeah. he died. He's been linked to over twenty. Ah, uh, okay, right, okay. So he's never been convicted of them, but he's been linked to over 20 child abductions up and down the country throughout Britain. Right. So Spanning that time frame anyway. Yes. Right, okay. So, yeah, so, so like, this, this, there was, there's every chance that this wasn't his first one. No, from, like, yeah, no. Right, okay, fine. So... I was only thinking that, that if, if, if that was his first one, it's a, it, it would be very rare that somebody that's a serial killer of that, that variety or, or of any variety, that the first off that one well. would be their the cleanest yeah, as such in yeah, airports. Yeah, the one that they couldn't get him done for yeah, even though they absolutely. questioned him. No, so he was linked to 20 and he's been, he was, before he died, he was questioned numerous times on several different abductions and missing girls because it just matched what he used to do so well. And he was very, very good at not framing himself, you know, like not incriminating himself yeah, okay. in any way in relation to them. The ones he got, they got him for in the end I don't. I need to look into it. I don't believe he ever admitted to them. Like I think they got him on it based on good evidence. Yeah, based on police work rather yes. than anything else. Right? Yeah. Okay. So I don't think if he'd done it that so he ever would admit to it. We know what your next long story is then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah, I'll do it <laughs> next time as well. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that's um. Jeanette Tate and sadly. Yeah, it's really sad. Forty-one story, yeah. years on, no uh, information. And I'm not going to say well done further. on that one because it's such a sad story. Yeah. Thanks. I'll take that. If that's all right. Yeah. That's fine. Um. And I'm not going to say I enjoyed it for the same reason. Yeah. So, should we take a break? Yeah. Okay. 
Scotland is a beautiful country with a rich history and a bright future. But it has a dark underbelly and it has been home to some of the most mysterious, disturbing and barbaric crimes ever committed. Cold-blooded murders, serial killers, gangland assassinations, violence against children, acts of terrorism, mysterious disappearances and acts of pure evil fueled by lust and greed. True Crime Scotland is a podcast dedicated to bringing you stories of the crimes that have happened in Scotland but have shocked the world. Some of the crimes we'll cover you'll be familiar with, others you'll have forgotten about and some you might never have heard of. Search for us on your podcast app or find us on Twitter and Facebook under True Crime Scott. Stories of real crimes and mysteries from Scotland. And that's us back. Hello. Got another drink. Good. So don't need to pause the podcast to go and <laughs> get a drink at the bar. Never mind. Do you know what? That's us all over, so I don't think they'll be very surprised by this point. Oh, no, I would. No. If this is the first episode you're listening to, we do, <laughs> surpri- we do it in the pub for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I can enjoy that. Well, you chose to move. <laughs> <laughs> so, so throw away, so cut <sighs> That's anyway, no, we're back. Anyway, we're back. Um, and we're going to go. Let's do some Patreon shoutouts before we go any further. Yes, please. Let's. Right. Uh, am I starting or are you starting? Um, why don't you? Okay. Well, I'd like to say thank you to Jane S. And I'd like to say a thank you to Ali M. And I'd like to say a thank you to Zoe S, who I had the pleasure of meeting. I know. I was very sorry not to be there. That's two of our Patreons I've met now. <sighs> well, why don't they come to Glasgow? Hmm. Because we don't record in Glasgow. <laughs> no, I'm just jealous. I'm just jealous. Well, never mind. Carry on. Thank you to Elizabeth M. And thank you to Anne V. Thank you to Mo or Maureen G. Thank you to Jill P. Thank you to Kerry C. Thank you to Andrea S. And thank you very much to David A. That makes us sound really popular that we had on the big long list this doesn't time. doesn't make us sound popular, we just are. Oh, right. Being big-headed today, are we cool? <laughs> I'm sorry. So I didn't get that memo. <laughs> it's just because we didn't do it last week. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much to everybody that um, subscribes to our Patreon. Um, we do greatly appreciate it. And quite frankly, I still f- find it... Ever so baffling. Yes. Um, and I hope you all enjoyed the most recent episode. Sorry there was a bit of a funny thing with the upload. Don't know what happened there. Mm, Some old. people couldn't download the episode, but we, we fixed it pretty quickly. Yep. So I hope you've all had a chance to listen and uh, let us know what you think. Um, Yeah, before I waffle any more further, would you like to hear a a story about some crime? Um, I don't know, maybe. We're here anyway. Might as well. I've got a pint and a half, we might as well do something. I've got half a glass of Diet Coke. I am ready to rock. And I just ate some caramel shortbread. This pub is laden with snacks tonight. Why, why is there so many like half tuna rolls kicking about? Domino's, Domino's League. Ah, uh, Dom's League night. They always put on a spread in the uh, settle uh, Yeah, if you're ever like hungry, peckish, and it's a Tuesday night, and it seems it's the right time of year, come into the settle in, get a wee roll. Sausage roll, half a scotch pie, perhaps. I know, I brought chips up the road. I wish I hadn't bothered. There was pies and all yeah, sorts. Have, the pies were hot as well when you arrived. I, had a, a, I, love, I love a hot pie. <laughs> <laughs> I had half of one. It was very nice. I, Sorry, please continue. I, I did say I was going to stop gibbering, but here we are. So my story this week has two names. I'm going to let you choose which one that we're going to use in the title. So it's oh. up, entirely up to you. Oh, thank you. So it's either the cleft chin murder. Oh my God. Or the GI gangster and the stripper. Ooh. Ooh. I like the cleft chin murder. Oh, do you? I yeah. really thought you were going to go with gangster and stripper. No, it's too obvious. Okay, fine. <laughs> too obvious for me. I like the cleft chin. Well, we'll get to why it's got both those names shortly. Excited. Um, so this is a bit of a kind of roller coaster story uh, that kind of, that uh, revolves around a woman called uh, Elizabeth Jones and her very short but quite intense week that she spent with a man named Carl Hutton, mm-hmm. who was an American soldier who she met in London. Okay. So in 1944, um, Elizabeth was an 18-year-old Welsh girl who'd had a rather rocky youth. She was born in Neath in South Wales, which is about 10 miles from Swansea, in 1926. And yet in 1939, aged 13, she ran away from home. Three years later, by the time she was 16, which was 1942, she was 
um, on her wedding day getting married to a soldier who was 10 years older than her by the name of Stanley Jones. And by her account later on, she had been well, beaten on her wedding day by her husband. Oh. After they got married. Oh, well. Yeah. Why, why Is did that not? Before? I thought that was what consummation was, no? And I'm leaving that sigh in. To, to you, it may be. <laughs> Tell me about your parties. <laughs> However, after her uh, lovely wedding night, uh, she decided to run off again, obviously. Well, I, yes, good decision, I think. This time she disappeared off to London in early of 1943, where she found work as a waitress and as a stripper. And she performed under the name of Georgina Grayson. Hmm, quite classy. Yeah, I quite liked it. That's why I put it out. Like, yeah, I quite like that. That's yeah, quite nice. That's why I popped it in, yeah. Um, and she carried on working with, uh, as both until the following year, when in October of 1944, whilst in a wee tea room, in Hammersmith, she met an American GI by the name of Carl Halton. H-U-L-T-E-N. Mm-hmm. Halton was born in Sweden, but not long after his birth, his parents and him moved to Massachusetts, where he went to school. After school, he worked a few jobs before enlisting in the U.S. Army after the U.S. were dragged into the first Second World War uh, after Pearl Harbor was born, bombed. On the day in October of 1944, Halton introduced introduced himself to Elizabeth as Ricky Allen, a lieutenant in the American army. But the real facts are he was actually a private who was currently AWOL, uh, absent without leave, from the 501st Airborne Division of the US Army. Elizabeth told him in return that her name was Georgina Grayson, or Georgie for short. Cute. And so they were both living in a bit of a dream world where they were playing the part of exotic dancer and officer in the army. Both were known to be a bit of, uh, I put dreamer, but they're both kind of just fantasists. Mm-hmm. They both wanted to live these crazy lives and, and, and be somebody. With Elizabeth or Georgie having said that she dreamed of something do, doing something exciting with her life. And, well, Ricky, Carl, mm. was there to try and help those dreams come true. Hmm. This is like the start of a fantastic romantic story. Oh, it takes a turn. I bet it does, it, based on the nature of this podcast. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad, far, I'm enjoying. I'm glad I've set it up for you. You've set this I could whimsical, do, we lovely... Could, we could do it as one of those like dice stories. If you roll evens, I'll tell you about the murders. <laughs> if, if, if we roll odds, I'll just tell you... I'll make some shit up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one of those stories. One of those stories. <laughs> I don't, what are they called? Um, pick your destiny type like things. choice stories. Yeah, yeah you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. Um... So they, whilst were together in the tea room, they decided they would meet the the following day for a date. And the next day, Carl slash Ricky picked up, uh, picked her up in an army, a US army vehicle that had clearly been acquired from the base before he went missing. Well, in what turned out to be the start of a kind of crazy crime spree for the next six days, the first date was a bit of a different one mm. and they decided to go on a drive and um, trying to show him how much of a uh, crazy man he was uh, Carl knocked a woman off a bike with the truck jumped out the truck and robbed her as she lay, la- lay in the road Oh, um, it was during this kind of car date as such that Halton decided to tell her the truth about him and not only that he was in the stolen truck but he'd fled the army he also showed her the service revolver that he had stashed on him. All of this had seemed to be a bit of a, a bit of a turn on, kind of a, an excitement, a bit of a streak to to Elizabeth, who told him she wanted to be a gun mall. Oh, who was a female companion to a gangster, essentially. Yeah. Um, um, wh- whatever it did for her, all of this, this knocking is like life of danger. Yeah, 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 totally. Bonnie and Clyde. It, so they're compared as a. Uh, compared to Bonnie and Clyde in a couple of the sources I read um, I would like to say they are a very although the crimes aren't they're a comical version of Bonnie and Clyde yeah they, they're a man's Bonnie and Clyde no, stupid oh stupid I'm going to say it again stupid what was that stupid um, 
Anyway, so, so yeah, so she tells him, I want to be a... Oh, it's great, I get to be this gun mall, blah, blah, blah. But either way, whatever it did, it certainly didn't put her off seeing him again. Insane. So the next day, they took another drive in the car, and this time the plan was to rob a pub. Now, this is the bit that shocks me the most. You never rob a pub. It's just not what's done. What, it's, Why? It's where you go when you feel... Like, when you've been robbed, where do you go? You go to the pub. Pub. So, do you know what? The pub is the answer to everything. You're in a good mood, you want to share your good news? Pub. You having a bad day? You want to moan? Pub. Want to start a random podcast? Pub. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Do not rob it. Fuck off. There you go. Um, rant over. The duo decided, have obviously changed their mind at some point during the day and decided that they wouldn't go and rob the pub. They would um, rob, rob a taxi instead. Uh, however, this didn't quite glo- go to plan. The plan, as such, was to pick a taxi and wait until the passenger left the taxi and then hold it up at gunpoint. However, their observation skills, they wouldn't get a Blue Peter badge for their observation <laughs> skills, um, because what they didn't notice was that there wasn't just one passenger in this taxi. Oh, blimey. And what they wouldn't have known, no matter what, was the other passenger was a US Army officer. <laughs> who also had his service revolver on him. Oh. So... um as such, obviously, they, they try and hold up this taxi at gunpoint. Army officer draws his weapon, and the two of them go, Oh, fuck! Mm. Bolt. Um, and, but they did. They managed to scarper, and they lived to try another day again. Mm-hmm. However, they fled the scene, and they decided that that's not all the fun you can have on a second date, is it? Oh, Lord. Um, so they decided to pick up a girl from a local train station. Okay. And offered to drive her to Reading instead. You know, here, oh, we'll get a lift. Come on, jump in. We're a lovely couple. Look oh, at us. Um, however, they stopped on the way, faking a, a flat tire in the car and just beat her to within an inch of her life uh, with a metal bar, stealing her bag and throwing her into a river. Wow. Wow. The classic second date. I thought that was more like third date territory myself, well, but these kids are moving faster in love. I get it. They're young. They're, they're young and young. love. Um, young, dumb and... In their final act, they two went a step further. They decided they were going to rob another taxi and get it right this time. So on Friday, October 6th, uh, 1944, they summoned a private hire cab from the side of the road. Uh, This cab was driven by a man uh, by the name of George Heath. George, when he pulled over, pointed out to him that he was a private hire and already had a job that he was on his way to, so he couldn't really take them anywhere. She managed to convince him that it was just a wee run home I need and, and it's on your way anyway uh, and, and he agreed at quite an extortionate fare to take her um, at which point uh, Carl saunters out of the shadows and joins them in the cab as well <sighs> whilst in the, the, the cab Halton shoots George Heath in the back uh, not killing him but, in, but lodging a bullet somewhere in him oh, l- leaving leaving quite a Substantial injury, um, and they move him into the passenger seat, and uh, Halton takes control of the car and starts driving him around. Elizabeth, however, looking at this injured man, decides, I know what to do. I'll go through his pockets, (laughs) and I'll rob him. So whilst the man is sitting, bleeding to death, essentially, in the the front of the car, she goes through his pockets and steals eight pounds, his watch and a few other personal items from him. George then dies 15 minutes later after his uh, sustaining his injuries and they dumped him in a ditch in Staines. Oh, lovely. My grand lives near there. The following day, Halton and uh, Elizabeth... No, sorry. The following day, Halton sold George's watch that they nicked for five quid to a local pawnbroker's. <sighs> Worth it. And went and picked up Elizabeth. The two of them then spent the day in the... In pu- the taxi? In the taxi. Yeah, sorry. Oh. I didn't say that there. Um... So yeah, when he picked up Elizabeth in the taxi that they'd just nicked from this guy. Sorry, not this guy, from George Heath. Mm-hmm. Apologies. And they spent the day, the two of them, in the pub and then went off to the, jo- the dog races with George's money where they spent a lot of it. After leaving the races, Elizabeth decided she wanted a fur coat. Of course she do. This bitch. Well, she's been at races all day. There was probably you know what, I bet she's a bit chilly. No, nah, it was probably she saw like, other posh women with fur mm. coats on and stuff like that. And, you know, George being... The gentleman. And smart... Yes. Really smart. Just decided to just take one off a woman in the street. Oh. You know, 
Is that not how you get a fur coat? It, it, it might be now because you can't buy one. Well, <laughs> but in the forties, I think you just went into a shop and bought one. Oh, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Problem being, they were spotted by a police officer while doing this. Oh my god! Um, and again, they went to making an escape. Say it again. Stupid. Well, I've I've written this exact. This is the sentence I've written here. here we go. I do not know how they managed to do this and escape because they are the dumbest criminals <laughs> I've ever covered. <laughs> Fact. Fact. Anyway, with them making a, their escape, fuck knows how. Maybe they're fast. <sighs> Well, apparently it was a it was a V eight Ford that they next, so it would have been a quick car. Mm. Um, but um, oh, they're st- they're still in the t- sorry. Oh, they're still I in the taxi. They were on foot escape? No, they're back in the taxi. Oh yeah, they're Bonnie and Clyde. Remember? Oh my goodness. Um. Anyway, they make their escape. Uh, still, obviously, under the ownership uh, of George's taxi. Um. Problem being, though, obviously the police had found the body of George. Yes. And they went. Where's his watch? Where's his money? Wait a minute, where's his car? Mm-hmm. So the police found his car, <laughs> parked rather beautifully behind an air raid shelter. Oh. Um, and it wasn't abandoned. They could, you know, they could tell yes. it hadn't been ditched. Yeah. So the police, on a hunch, kept an eye on the car. As you would, quite clever. And their patience paid off. I bet it didn't take long. At 9pm that evening. Yep, there we go. On the Sunday the 8th of October, uh, the pair's crime screw was brought to an end as Halton was apprehended by a police officer. Both of them were brought forward to be charged for murder, but there had been a law passed in America that American servicemen would be court-martialed by the US and not brought in front of a British court. However, on this occasion, having been interviewed by military police from the States, they decided that as he was a deserter... You can have him back and just handed him back to British authorities. We don't want to deal with him. Do you mean American? Yeah. No, no, he was handed back to British authorities. Oh, right. So, sorry. Uh, so, so an American uh, military police interviewed him and went, I see. Uh, no, you deserve oh, right, yeah, You deserve right. the army. We don't want anything to do with you. You're a piece of shit. Piss off. Here you go. Yeah, fine. They're probably going to hang you anyway. So Saves us the bother. Exactly. We don't need to take you back to America now. Yeah. Um, and And this is... Uh, this is why it became known as the GI gangster and the stripper, because obviously the British press at the time went, oh my God. Do you know what? I'm glad I've not chosen that as the title, because it's far too cool a title for that, these yeah. fucking idiots. Oh, and sorry, and it was the cleft chin murder, because George Heath had, Heath had a cleft chin. Fair. Uh, as simple as that. Yes. Um, obviously, both of them were found guilty. Of, of, sorry, the police obviously rounded the two of them up yes. after. yeah. Because he immediately went, oh, isn't it just me? It was Elizabeth too. <laughs> or um, Georgie or whatever she's or, yeah. calling herself at um, this point. And both of them were obviously brought in front of the, the court and uh, they were both found guilty and sentenced to be hanged. George, uh, sorry. Oh, you confused me there by saying Georgie. Sorry. No. <laughs> Carl Halton was hanged on the 8th of March, 1945 at Pentonville Prison by Albert Pierpoint, becoming the only American GI to be hanged by a British court. Elizabeth, however, was spared the noose as she was a woman and wasn't directly responsible for the killings. Oh, shut up. She spent nine years in jail before being released on licence in January of 1954 and we have no record of what happened to her afterwards. (sighs) So she was released at age 20, 26. So have a whole life ahead of you. And would, I, I couldn't find what happened to her after that. Do you know, I feel bad for huffing that she wasn't hung because I still don't agree with the death penalty, especially not, you know. But I just don't think it's fair that she didn't receive the same punishment as him. Like, they're both as equally as oh, yeah. culpable. He was doing it to impress her. Yeah, and she was loving it. And the two of them were batshit crazy. Just stupid. Yeah. Absolutely. Honestly, when I found this earlier, I found it under the title GI Gangster and Stripper and I went, oh, yes, yeah. I'm, I'm having that. And then I read it and I went, these people are fucking stupid. <laughs> and I got annoyed at them. And then I wrote it all out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm annoyed. I'm annoyed at how stupid they are. Yeah. I feel very sorry for George, uh, George Heath. Yes, of course. Me who was too. just a man doing his job. Um, <sighs> and I couldn't find, I, I, and I couldn't find the name of the 
woman they attacked yes, yeah. or the girl on the bike. Um, For Christ's sake. Yeah. Did the woman... So the over woman, six days, the girl this all that they picked up from the station and chucked her in a river after kicking her in, did she survive? There was no record. So they were tried for one murder. Okay. So there's no record of her. Well, presumably, though, if, like, she would have had to... How would they have known? I get. I guess the story would have come out. Yeah, from her, presumably. Yeah, I would guess so. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, bit of a fucking stupid one. Pair of fuds. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's the, the cleft chin murder. I enjoyed it because I hated it so much. <laughs> <laughs> one of those ones. Do you know how I found it? How? Um, I looked up <laughs> Welsh murders. Oh, oh, nice. Yeah, we don't really do Wales. No. Well, actually, my first one, Leanne Sabine, she was Welsh. Of course, yeah, indeed. Um, and it's literally because I was talking to Corin this week about, ah. about some bits and pieces about the website. And oh, I went, hello, Corin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a wee, uh, a wee Welsh murder for him. Lovely. That doesn't quite come out the way I meant it to, but there we are. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's the... the 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 random story that that could be and this called. was all within a week. Uh, so they met, and six days later, they were caught. Jesus Christ! Also, like to point out that that's this week, seventy years ago, oh, seventy five years ago. Oh, yeah, ha- happy anniversary. Ish. Ish. <laughs> um, so yeah, they met in uh, in October, and I think they met in October third, and nice. then October eighth nice. was when the police caught them. So that would have been this this Thursday. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Mad, that. So, yeah, like I say, that's the story that, of the Cleft Chin murder. And it was just a wee funny one that I... Not a funny one, but yeah, you know what I mean? It was yeah. just a wee bit like, yeah. this is silly. And I quite liked it. Yeah, so. I quite enjoyed that, actually. Um, if you have enjoyed what you've listened to... What is it? See, that segue. This is so professional. Segway. <laughs> until we, um, until if we you've liked, comment on it. Uh, if you've liked what you listen to, please do uh, go on to wherever you download your podcast from and do hit rating and uh, reviews. Give us uh, a little subscribe if you really, really like it. Please do subscribe. There are 37-ish episodes out now. Yeah. If you include Including our specials. Our specials. Um, and, and if uh, that's not enough for you. Well done. Why don't you go onto our Patreon, Segway. become one of our beautiful patrons, and you can listen to our one, uh, like our monthly special episodes that come out for our patrons only. Indeed, extra, one and extra. they cover like anything. Yeah, Good and wonderful. Um, one extra episode on the fifteenth of every month. Yep. Um, that you you will be treated to. Uh, all of our patrons get access to them. Every tier has access to it. So please do go on there. You also get. A little badge. Lovely badge and a note from us mm-hmm. and, and, and bits and bobs. Um, One big thing, actually. Carry on. I've totally, totally been meaning to say. Happy birthday to you for tomorrow, my oh, love. Thank you very much. You're um, very welcome. Yeah, I'm not, not making a big deal of 37. It's no. just it's one that I'm going to let slide by, I think. <laughs> but happy birthday and I hope you have a beautiful day. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. Um, it will be when you guys listen to this it will have been two days ago so yeah, <laughs> it, so yeah get your already, happy birthdays in for our done. Bob Art unfortunately we will not be doing a drunken tour of Bob's birthday like we did mine this year I'm very disappointed in you no but mainly because I'm I'm struggling with more than a pint yeah. to be honest you know. you're making a bloody good effort anyway oh yeah I need, I need to wet the whistle <laughs> keep the whistle wet that's what it is um if you'd like to uh, chat with us or see, our, uh, see what's going on in, Twist- in the, the world of Twisted Britain, please do find us on social media. You'll find us on Twitter. Twisted Britain. You'll find us on Facebook. Twisted Britain. You'll find us on Instagram. Twisted Britain. You can also join our lovely discussion group that's growing all the time, which is on Facebook, and you will find it by looking for... Twisted Britain Discussion Group. It's a really original name that we came up all by ourselves. It took us days, days of thought. Storm, like, clouds... Storm, storm clouds. Storm, more think of brainstorm word clouds. I think yours is probably more lines. is a storm cloud than anything else. <laughs> um, I don't know what's happened to us this week. Moving on, we've been like fifty percent on top form, very professional. Okay, oh, cool. We are keeping that big ego up to this right through the whole podcast. Fifty percent total nonsense. Right, yeah, totally. You're fine. <laughs> um, you're the fifty percent nonsense. Ouch. Um, yeah, you can also check out our website, which is back up and running. It's a nice place to find uh, all the episodes and stuff like that. They they should automatically feed into that. You uh, can also email us. Oh, you can. Sorry, I meant to say this at the end, didn't I? I said I was going to do this. Yes. Somebody messages us to say that um, they don't do social media, but they'd like to get in touch. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, but you don't do social media, 
Um, a, well done for not doing social media. Congrats. But B, you can email us at twistedbritainpodcast at gmail.com. One more time. Twistedbritainpodcast at gmail.com. Twi- Twistedbritainpodcast, all one word, at gmail.com. Other than that, you can find our merch links on all of our social medias mm-hmm, and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, and a big, yeah, just a big thank you very much for listening to us. And if you've made it this far, well done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we'll just go with... Uh, Thank you, love you, bye. Thank you, love you, bye. Don't date men that have cleft chins, bye. That's rude, no, sorry. That's a terrible end. I'm just going to stop you right there and say it was George Heath that had the... It was the murder victim that had the cleft chin. Oh, you didn't... That didn't come across. Oh, sorry, that's what I meant to say. Oh, I thought you... No, I think you did say that. I got... I've got... He was a hard the George and the Georgies and stuff. He was a hard-working man. Date men with cleft chins. Thank you, love you, goodbye. Jesus. <laughs>